Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey everyone, I'm William Harris. I'm the founder and CEO of Element and the host of the Up Arrow Podcast, where I feature the best minds in e-commerce to help you scale from 10 million to 100 million and beyond as you up arrow your business and your personal life. I'm excited about the guest that I have today, Braxton Manley. Braxton is the co-founder and operator of Braxley Bands, Mystic Gum, and Peace Love Hormones. His longest-running business, Braxley, started from a college project and has now scaled to earn over $6 million in revenue. Each business is family-run and truly unique in concept. Braxley, I am excited to have you here. Brax, Bra- I called you Braxley. Braxton, I am excited I, to have you here. You wouldn't be the first. Yeah. I know. It's a, it's a play on your name, isn't it? Like yeah. Braxton Manley, Braxley. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even come up with the name. It was a class project and a girl in the group came up with it. And I said, all right, well, it's just a class project. Whatever. We'll go with it. And <laughs> sure enough, now, <laughs> now it's everywhere. So, Yeah. Little did you know. Well, I mean, I spell element E-L-U-M-Y-N-T for the same concept where when I first started it, it wasn't a thing. And so it's like, oh, I like the spelling. I think this is really fun. And you know, now here I am. And that's what it is. Yeah. I get it. Um, speaking of which, I want to get into the good stuff. Before I do, I want to make sure that I announce our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Element. Element is an award-winning advertising agency optimizing e-commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, we've helped 13 of our customers get acquired with the largest one selling for nearly $800 million and one that IPO'd recently. You can learn more on our website at element.com, which is spelled E-L-U-M-Y-N-T.com. That said, enough of that stuff. On to the meat of what we're talking about. Um, this is an interesting one for me because I talk a lot about growing from 10 million to 100 million, but what if that's the wrong goal? Uh, and you are the one who kind of put this seed in my mind, so I'm excited about this. So we're going to talk more about managing three D to C brands with economies of scale and how that looks at things. So I'm excited about that. Um, I want to start by basically just saying how. How do I know if that's the wrong goal? And like, when when is going from ten million to one hundred million the, the wrong goal? Yeah, well, I mean, I I do believe all these businesses will reach a hundred million dollars. It's just that uh, you know, I everybody has their own dynamic, and I felt really creatively inspired at first to do Braxley, which was elastic Apple Watch bands, and we grew mm-hmm. that to the size that it felt like it could reach to. We're still trying to find the way to grow it. We tried coming out with a new product and, and you know, we got some decent growth from that. But, um, you know, ultimately at that same time, I, I started uh, dating my now fiance, Maddie, who has her own e-commerce business called Peace Love Hormones. And I realized when working with her, it was like, okay, I can really own this whole area of like, for me, it was, it's like managerial role of, of mm. uh, managing all the marketing channels and, and generally having a good understanding of e-commerce well well that allowed maddie to focus on product and actually go back to school for her supplement brand and so that was when the birth of oh wait actually doing two of these at once could actually be really not just uh efficient but also really inspiring and really enjoyable because Mm -hmm. it's like having three like right now basically i'm a father of three rather than a father of one and like in, it's a metaphor, but also it's it's pretty true. Like I'm, I, these are all my kind of my babies, and I have to like spend sure. time on each of them. And you kind of just got to get it done. Like if if one of them requires attention, got to figure it out. And I think they're all going to grow up to be really successful. So the mm-hmm. idea is, I'll, I have a better chance at one of them becoming successful or, uh, out of the three than if I were to. I think, you know, and what I'm trying to do here, if I were to just focus on one. I don't know if it would lead to the, you know, say it's elastic Apple watch bands, what I started with. That mm-hmm. might be really hard to get to hundred million. And maybe if it just does a million a year, that's still pretty great for my lifestyle that I'm ultimately optimizing for. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I like the way you put that. You know, there's, there's two different things that you called out there that I like. One is the idea of economies of scale. Um, I think about this. Brandon Turner talks about this a lot in his podcast, bigger pockets. Right. And, uh, the idea of uh, even just one rental versus uh, a four unit rental. There's there's economies of scale in just having four units there. You've already got somebody going over there to mow the lawn or whatever that might be. And so you're you're just making more uh, profit on, on each one of those units. And so there's a lot of uh, 
promise there. The other thing that I like that you called out too um, is just that idea of what are you optimizing for? You could optimize for a $100 million business that you're miserable with, or you could optimize for a million dollar a year business that you're wildly happy and satisfied with and that uh, allows you the lifestyle that you'd like to lead. And, and I think that that's an important consideration when looking at you know, what is the goal and uh, in, in being able to use that to identify what should the goal be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about the backstory because you were talking to me about this before. Um, like you said, you started this in your college. The, the name came up uh, out, of, out of nowhere here. Um, but you started this with like $20 and like hand stitching these together yourself. Um, college project. Tell me a little bit more about what, what gave you this idea in the first place made you say, this is a thing that I'm going to spend my time and money on. Yeah, I think I read the four hour work week at a impressionable yeah. age. And also I'm, you know, my, my, I, my parents were entrepreneurs, my, my dad and my uncle in the, 90s had a, a stretchy athletic wear like pants uh brand called nowhere fashions for anywhere that i want to bring back one day by the way but they were nice. like kind of serial entrepreneurs and then eventually they're now they own restaurants in austin and san antonio and so um from the an early age i was like oh i, I identified as like somebody that were to end up being an entrepreneur i think because i was inspired by you know seeing the adults that i grew up around um, you know, be that and, and seeing all the, all the freedom that came with that. Like I wanted to be able to travel. That's like, I was like, you know, no matter what I grew up doing, like I want to be able to have location freedom and to travel and to like really see the world. And it seems like there's nothing more amazing to me than that. And so read the four hour work week and I was like, oh, okay, so selling stuff online is the ticket to being able to travel the world. Like, you know, figuring it out from that angle. And at the time, I had just uh, signed up for this marketing class that I basically had to bring a product to market um, and come up with a business plan about it and a marketing strategy. And my idea was Apple Watch bands sold on the Internet because uh, and not just Apple Watch bands, but my own that I came up with the design mm -hmm. for ma making them out of socks. So I was literally cutting up athletic socks, stitching them onto a little metal piece to slide onto an Apple Watch and then but showing that the the band itself is actually far superior to the Apple Watch bands that were available at the time, and so we were first to market with a stretchy Apple Watch band. Turns That's out crazy. it ended up it ended up pretty much blowing up online in like 2017. We scaled, we we like tripled the business to 18, tripled the business to 19, tripled it again to 20, and then um, 2021 is when we really saw the plateau hit. And then, you know, mm. I've since struggled in a lot of ways with keeping up with the same, that, that same market has changed so dramatically. So I've also learned a lot of very hard lessons along the way um, to, to figure out how to remain profitable, to remain a business. Yeah. Which you told me about, there was a book that you're reading, Profit First. Is that the name of the book that you're reading? Yes. Yeah. So, so what's the concept here of Profit First? Because I think you said this past year you spent some time kind of reading through that book and changing the way that you operated the business. What kind of changes did you make and what's this book really about? I mean, aside from the title being obvious. Yeah. So, okay. Basically, the best way to put it is everybody is taught in business school that revenue minus expenses equals profit. In sure. Profit First, the idea is that let me think about this. It's revenue minus profit equals expenses. Mm. Mm. And so you have to adjust your expenses around a constant profit. Mm -hmm. You can't spend money you don't have type philosophy. Like, because sure. you, yeah, under this methodology, you'll never go in debt and you'll never overextend yourself. You'll never go bankrupt. Like, Eric Banholtz from Beard Brand taught me a really valuable lesson back in the day, which he calls it the water bug analogy, where basically there's this, uh, I guess, a, a type of bug called a water bug in the desert that can mm -hmm. survive without water for 100 years. And it basically wow. like somehow it, it hibernates in a certain way where it can survive for 100 years without water. And he says, essentially, like, use that as a metaphor for your business and be a water bug business where you could, if, if say, somehow money dried up for 100 years. How do you, how are, well, as soon as the rain falls, how are you able to then 
start running again. Mm, I like that because there's going to be droughts and then there's going to be rainfall. And so you have to be in a position to where you can be able to be in business. Then it reminds me a lot of the infinite game by uh, Simon Sinek, right? That idea where it's like the only way that you lose is if you stop playing the game. Um, yeah. And so in this situation, like you said, it's like, how do you weather through those, those droughts that you're there when the rain comes um, in a profit first mentality makes sense. So what are some things that you did to be able to adjust your businesses to look at and use this framework? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I guess, one of the big decisions I have had to make is whether or not I need to let agencies go. Um, if, you know, so for instance, in 2021, we were spending over $100,000 a year on our email marketing agency. Mm -hmm. In 2022, I did it myself. So I effectively saved $100,000 by just taking that rollover again. And, and it's, but it's very complicated because the, the question is, did I earn as much revenue as that agency mm -hmm. did? What is my time worth? All these things, but that but that's the hard part is like if you don't have a hundred thousand dollars to pay the agency, then you have to do it yourself. So it's like you have sure. to retreat before you can progress again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? Where sometimes we think uh backwards motion is is actually a step in the wrong direction, but sometimes a backwards motion can be the step that you need to take in order for forward progress to start up again. Yeah. I like that. Yep. You were talking about um Riding the financial highs, then sometimes feeling like one of your brokest friends. I feel like this is a concept that a lot of uh, a lot of entrepreneurs can relate to. Where there are, man, there are some good years, and it feels really good. And there are some tough years. A lot of us went through that during COVID. There were some, you know, good and bad and whatever things. But um, what made you use that specific phrasing when you talked to me about this, about like feeling like one of your brokest friends? Like, what did what did that feel like, and how have you worked through those feelings? Yeah. So, I mean, some of our most profitable years that we had as a business were the years I, right after I graduated college. So I was 22, 23, 24. Those were the years that I, I was able to take home like multiple six figures in distributions. And it was mm -hmm. like, this is crazy. Like, I'm like, I'm like going to retire. I literally put, I remember putting that, you know, on my goals or whatever that I wanted to retire by 25. Sure. And now I'm 28. And um, I'm not retired. I've actually started <laughs> <laughs> working more jobs, right? But yeah. um, when limbo, but I, I think what you know what then happened, right, was right around 25 is when iOS 14 and a half changed, and mm. we we weren't running profitable uh, ads at that time. And it was like, mm -hmm. well, what do you do? Because we need to get traffic to the website, and we're not in a bunch of retail stores. Like we we the the whole thing was built. We scaled it up to about two and a half million dollars in. 2021. And it was great. You know, it was, it was totally working, but then all of a sudden you see month over month P and L's and you're like, well, something's mm -hmm. broken and we don't really know how to fix it. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's required us to literally do a full flush of our whole entire marketing strategy Our everybody that was on, uh, an, you know, as an working for us as an agency, We've completely changed the people that we're working with, and and it's been good in the long term because we had to do that. And now we're working with people that are more aligned with us, that are uh, better performers, that are local. So one of the things I I really have been trying to do was I live in Austin, great city for this type of industry. I decided mm -hmm. I'm like I only want to work with people in Austin. Like if I can't go get a coffee with somebody and talk about something over a real conversation, like I don't know how you can really be that collaborative. We were working with some people that weren't even in America, you know, they're overseas and it's like we're on way different time zones, different like cultural backgrounds and, and to expect them to be able to make awesome creatives for a brand is like, they don't even have the product in their hands. Mm -hmm. It's never mm -hmm. going to work. Yeah. It's very different. Um, and I would say that there's pros and cons to both of those, right? Uh, we are a remote agency and so, uh, we were remote before COVID um, and I would say one of the benefits is I have the freedom and flexibility to get the best talent no matter where they are, uh, which is great. We've got people in Denver. We've got people in Pennsylvania. We've got people here in Minnesota, Wisconsin. And, um, I, and I like that. But to your point, there is a trade off. There is a little bit of a collaboration that just can't happen the same way that it would if we were all in the same office. And so 
Um, I think you have to evaluate those trade-offs for each individual business and for how you're running a business, right? And so like certain businesses, maybe that's totally fine. Other businesses, it's not. And, and I can see the v value and benefit of what you're saying about being able to just go grab a coffee and collaborate with somebody. It's, it's unmatched. And I think in this digital world, we, we really lose focus of that human to human connection. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I think the best thing that could have happened to the rest of the world was like this remote work thing. I, 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 but also like the, the like guy I've always built it to be remote. It's always intentionally been remote way before COVID and stuff. But like now mm. I'm realizing that the hybrid model, I think in some way is like the best. So, I mean, this is, we were, we're running a very small executive team here in my companies. It's my fiance who is in, I live with, and then it's my brother who lives like 15 minutes away. Sure. And so we're like pretty easy to get in person with, but we're still technically remote. Like I have my office, Maddie has her office. My brother Zach has his office and we don't really mm -hmm. see each other every day. Like in this sense, like working, mm -hmm. in, it's not like being in an office, it's remote. Yeah. But like you said, it's the hybrid because you can at least meet up in person together. Yeah. I think it's like, it's easier not to, but doing it, it doing it requires some level of like, commitment to like you know managerial and, and like hr excellence mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um i've even said that i think there's something to be said about getting in close proximity with other people from a competitive standpoint let's say to play a game of basketball or whatever because i think that we need to be around the like sweat and pheromones of each other to continue to push us to drive, right? Like our entire existence has re has, uh, has basically been a part of being in these communities where it's like, you're, you're around somebody and it's like their drive, you know, propels you forward. And it's like, okay, there's this competition and it's a healthy competition. And, and you, you can kind of get that a little bit online, but you can't simulate the pheromones and the, the, the actual things that are got going on scientifically that are causing you to say, I got to do this. I got to step up. I'm going to win whatever that might be. Yep, totally. Um, I want to dig into some of the tactical, practical things that you guys are doing. And I know that um, we were talking about CRO being a big focus of where you guys are uh, differentiating yourselves. There was um, something that you tweeted about that I thought was interesting. You said there's a movement that we can all get behind motion product pictures. What are motion product pictures and why should we care about them? Yeah, so we started basically making our product pictures gifs and mm -hmm. it's been really fun because first off it captures the product in a three-dimensional way like in a real three-dimensional way you can see it and it's so attractive that way because it's we're not used to it and it's so funny that we don't do that, that it's not normalized because uh it seems like the future and it's like totally available to us um sure. so why not make your product pictures like feel like they're jumping out of the screen and it's really easy to do. We're attracted to motion, aren't we? Um, there's something in our uh, eyes that is attracted to something that's moving. Have you noticed uh, a big change in certain metrics from a CRO perspective from implementing that versus not having, uh, and I'm going to say gifts. So we're both going to have to argue about which one that is, but I'm going to say gifts from adding gifts slash gifs slash peanut butter to your website. <laughs> yeah. I, what kind of, yeah. What kind of like metric changes have you noticed? Well, that's a good question. We have noticed our, our broader conversion rate of our website is continually up month over month, but we're also like sprinting on a bunch of improvements. Like we've sure. completely gamified the cart. We've overhauled our product pictures on Braxley. So I will say this, we haven't done the GIF product picture thing for Braxley yet because it's extremely difficult to do renderings for the mm. Braxley watch bands because it's soft elastic. It, it, every time we've tried to do a rendering, it just looks hard. And sure. so fortunately, my other two brands do use hard bottles and cans to, as the packaging. So it looks great as a rendering. Anyway, that being said, um, yeah, we, we have done a lot to increase conversion rate uh, in a bunch of these different ways. It, it's difficult to, to test it because we, 
you know, we have um, the, uh, what is the common testing app? Uh, IntelliGems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have run IntelliGems tests. I know that's like good form, but like, I also believe it's like, like that also takes a lot of time to do. And so you're, you're, you have a trade off of if you have a high degree of conviction that something's going to for sure improve, just make all those changes and see what the conversion rate kind of does. And then test almost like then test stuff you would pull out instead of adding one thing at a time over the course of many months, add all the things that you think are going to be good. And so I, anyway, testing is kind of a complicated thing, but um, I mean, I am happy to share real numbers. I just don't have Shopify immediately pulled up in front of me. That's you don't need to pull it up for exact examples. Um, I'm, I'm with you on the testing stuff. Uh, last episode here uh, that we just had was uh, Will Leach. And one of the things that he talks about is your uh, conscious mind versus your non-conscious mind uh, and the processing power between the two. And the, the conscious mind apparently has somewhere like, I think it's like 50 bits per second or something. And then the non-conscious is like 35,000 bits per second. And I could be off on what it is, but it's like a massive difference. Um, and I think sometimes we downplay the incredible processing power that our gut feeling actually has, that there is a computer in us that has processed an insane amount of information and, and helps us make those decisions. Um, yeah, best form, sure, run the A-B test. But if you're... If you're not Amazon, and everybody likes to point to Amazon, if you're not Amazon, um, I think that you can over test and like that causes a lack of actual tests to be done or a lack of actual changes being made to your point where you're like, look, this should be fairly intuitive. Make this change. It doesn't work. You can always revert. You haven't completely killed the company. But if you're small, um, that one test, that AB test might take you five months to actually get to stat sig. And what was the point of making only one change just to wait in there? That's also the big cost of the business as well. Yeah. Um, you also talked about like there's a pop up strategy that your brother Zach uh, is really uh, excited about. What's going on with the pop ups that you guys are excited about here? Yeah, I mean, gosh, I think that pop ups are probably the most important thing that you could ever actually Im incrementally improve on your whole entire business because all the profit for us is made in retention marketing. Like mm -hmm. we're breaking even as most people are on, on acquisition mm -hmm. and maybe that's the right way to do it. And then make, you have to make your profit in retention. So if your retention sucks, your profit probably sucks. Yep. If you are excellent at retention, you're probably doing really nicely. And so the best way I think you can increase the performance of your retention marketing is through just capturing more contacts via the pop-up that's where most of them come from. And then, and then immediately making them excited to kind of uh, engage with it. And so I see so many brands that are still really, you know, really big brands. And I'm like, damn, their pop-up is like so lame. Like if only they improved this, would they know like sure. the, the impact it has? So we are using Amped right now. Uh, I heard they just got acquired. Um, so they might not be compatible for uh, Clavio stores anymore, but um, for the, for the foreseeable future, we'll continue to use Amped until we can't because it has doubled our opt-in rate and we also, it looks great. So it adds value to the brand and, and we're able to really quickly change up like the copy on it and the offer. Um, we, we, we find that honestly just running a 10% offer is like the best thing because people just want to save a little bit of money. Like the difference between offering 10% versus 15% is not going to make a difference. And mm -hmm. if you say something like, oh, you might win a free gift card, people are, aren't buying it. Like just give them a little 10%, let them save three, four bucks. Like that's enough to get somebody to give you their email. Um, so yeah, don't, I would say don't overcomplicate it, but use something that is like really smart as a tool. Yeah, no, that's a great call out about not overcomplicating it. Um, simple offers. Uh, I have a love hate relationship with uh, pop ups. So maybe you can sway my mind here. One of the things that I, uh, as a marketer, dislike about pop ups just in general is that I'm 
offering a discount now to somebody who hasn't purchased. And yes, that might potentially increase my, my purchases then, right? Um, but I've captured a purchase of somebody who's looking for a discount. And when I look at LTVs, especially for some brands, I notice that there's a difference in the lifetime value of somebody who came in with a discount from their first purchase versus somebody who didn't come in with a discount on their first purchase. Um, have you noticed a difference? And maybe this is a, a thing that happens to do with, you know, higher AOVs. And so maybe, maybe if I'm looking at, you know, AOV of $400, this is a bigger deal. Are you, are you seeing much of a difference when you look at the LTV of the difference in customers there? I don't know those metrics. Like that's something I, I would like to be able to dive into more. Um, sure. I think that I am somebody that generally just looks at like a broader, like performance view of stuff and mm -hmm. like analytics are something that I try to have like the minimum effective dose. So that way I can. Another good Tim Ferriss call out there. <laughs> <laughs> did he say that? I honestly don't know. Oh yeah, he did. And oh. uh, I think it was the, the four hour body uh, oh. he had uh, the MED, the minimally effective dose. Oh, okay. Yeah. But he hasn't said how, as it relates to no, 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 no. analytics of something. Okay. Yeah. No, <laughs> sure. So, you know, I, I'm somebody that I, I'm, I'm a creative and like, I am not the numbers guy. That's my brother. And I really just try sure. to let that, like, I'm, you know, one half of the brain and he's the other half. And like, the more that we can focus on, like, I, I would rather go to him and, and, and say like, what's working well, what's not. And then sure. I can focus on designing and the, the abstract of it all and the vision. So it's just like a, it's a dynamic. Like I find there's so much power in like not having to be a specialist at everything. I, or in being the generalist, like that's kind of more my thing. I, I see the broad numbers of like, say how the pop-up is performing. And I'm like 19%. I think that's what it was last month. I don't know, but that's pretty good. So let's keep going. Yeah, you need somebody who who has the ability to pull back and see the bigger picture and somebody else that can dive in and get granular with metrics. And so I think that there's an importance to having both pieces. Maybe this is a bad next question then based on that exact thing. So if it is, you just say like, dude, I really just don't know. Like that's a question for Zach. But um, I noticed you were also talking about uh, you, you guys had reduced the impact of leaked discount codes. Uh, and that's just something that a lot of companies struggle with. There's, they've, they've run discount codes. Um, that have now made it out there through all of the different influencers that they've used. And um, maybe they've done, you know, some of those other uh, coupon sites. And so there's these coupon codes everywhere. Uh, and while it was good for like that initial burst of sales, now it just exists in perpetuity sometimes on these different discount codes. Um, and it, it, people wonder, how is that impacting my, my, you know, first order AOV? How is that impacting my LTVs? Um, what did you guys do to fix the leaked coupon discount codes? Yeah, I mean, I would say one, using social snowball and using safe links on social snowball. Mm. So the, a lot of the leaked codes were affiliate codes. So, you know, oh, we're going to work with somebody on the sure. Shopify collabs. They get code William. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, William earned freaking, you know, $2,000 today in commissions. Like he's crushing it. We're like, what did he post? It's like, oh, he didn't post anything. His code is just leaked on Honey. And so mm. not only is the customer getting his discount, who's never seen his content, William's getting the kickback on the commission. And, he, sure. and so it's a terrible situation if you're not keeping an eye on it. So the answer to it is using Social Snowballs, which is an affiliate marketing platform that we've switched to from Shopify Collabs. Um, you know, Shopify Collabs is great. It's free and you can do the free gifts and stuff. But like, oh, I believe only Social Snowball does the safe links feature where the affiliate then gets, you know, you, it generates like a dynamic coupon code. So the answer to your question ultimately is use dynamic coupon codes everywhere you can. Um, sure. And if you're not, if you can't use it somewhere, like set a timer in your phone to switch it every month. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's smart. I use, I use, I got to be careful saying it. I use my Siri all the time. I got to be careful because, you know, Siri will hear me right now instead of another thing. But it's like, I, <laughs> I'm going to say it and I'm just nervous because it's like, oh no, she's going to do it. But I'm like, hey Siri, remind me to do blah, 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 blah at one o'clock tomorrow. And I, man, it's like it's our version of a sticky note that would just be, you know, put up somewhere. It's like, no, nah, I had to just turn Siri off here, but yeah, it's funny. Um, 
something else you were talking about with uh that I was really excited about. You were talking so the the other company, uh Peace Love Hormones. Um, you're working on some interesting stuff for uh like first purchase subscriptions. Tell me what you guys are doing that's so different there from what you've seen other prescription based companies do. Yeah, I mean, so we haven't implemented it yet, but okay. the idea is to basically charge more on the first purchase subscription and then less on subsequent subsequent subscriptions. Interesting. Rather than doing the common lead on discount the first purchase and then charge full price moving forward. So the discount, the discount makes sense, right? You're trying to get somebody to purchase that first order and then continue to, to, to subscribe and buy. Why charge more? What's the thought process? Well, because I think on one hand, you just don't want people gamifying you where they, they're giving you, you're giving them a discount and then they're taking advantage of the discount and they know that they're going to subscribe and then unsubscribe as soon as they get their product. That's like no way to do business with anybody. And it's weird that, sure. that, because, because nobody wants to then like have to pay full price after that. And so the idea is with the charging more in the beginning, it's more of like a club membership joining initiation fee, which is normal. Mm -hmm. If you join a gym, mm -hmm. you're going to pay yep. an extra hundred bucks when you sign and then it'll yep. be less moving forward. And, and gyms have pretty high LTVs. Sure. Um, that being said, we're going to also value add the first purchase. So you're going to get, you know, you're not just paying more because you're like, well, you want to, you're going to join. No, but you're going to get a reusable shot glass that you can take the herbal supplement. It's a liquid dropper. So you, you, every serving is done into a dropper into a custom piece of hormones shot glass, which then keeps them more mm. consistent because it's a, it's a more like satisfying way to take the medicine rather than um, just doing the dropper straight onto the tongue. It's like too intense of a flavor. And so we're going to give them a really cool shot glass. We're going to give them uh, uh, digital products. So they're going to get access to our library of digital products, which, you know, you can put a price tag on that. Let's say that's a $50 value, whatever it's digital. It's, but, but it really is like productized. And then mm -hmm. You can say we're going to have in-person activations like we're in Austin. We're already kind of doing that with the brands mm -hmm. like Maddie can host an in-person event in Austin and, and her followers and friends will like want to be there for that. So and maybe it could be expanded on like we could do these in all the cities. And the idea is like right now, the tangible is so attractive to people. So something like, oh, if I join this subscription, I can get exclusive access to an in-person activation even if it's something they're not going to go to, they're just like, that sounds awesome. Like once a year, even you, the minimum dose is once a year sure. in Austin, we're all going to gather at the park and we're going to say hi to everybody and we'll have free samples of the product. Sure. And we're only going to tell people that are subscribed. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden now you have a club membership where you have exclusive access to in-person events. I think it's very interesting. Um, I know the, the yacht club up the road. I don't have a yacht, but I've looked at it uh, just for fun. And they charge, uh, like you said, there's like an initiation fee. Most golf clubs do. Um, there, there is something about being able to be a part of an exclusive club that we're willing to pay a little bit more for. Um, and so I see the point of where you're going with this. I, it's a very interesting concept. I know you said you haven't implemented it yet, but I hope that you do. And when you do, I, I would like to see a follow up on how this is working out because I think this is I don't know of anybody else that has done this yet. Maybe they have. Uh, I just don't. I'm not aware of anybody. That's well, no, I, I have to give credit where it's due. I actually discovered this from a brand, uh, a new coffee brand called mm. Clue, K-L-O-O. -O. Nice. Clue Coffee. It's like this super high end coffee concentrate in a bottle. And so basically kind of the way they're doing it is you get this beautiful bottle. It looks like a tequila bottle that, you know, your coffee goes in, mm -hmm. you get that on your first purchase and it's $35. And then after that, I think it's like $28 something. And so it's, it's seven bucks less, but then you don't get the bottle. You get the coffee refill in a bag. So it's more mm. sustainable, but also they're saving a ton of costs on that and kind of passing those savings off to the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like a win-win uh, 
it, it'll be an interesting case study. And I agree, it's a kind of a big test. And it's one to be very data and, you know, statistic oriented about because you don't necessarily want to just try that blindly and have no clue. Sure. Working. Sure. Well, you will have to follow up with you and Zach on that one. Yeah. Um, uh, so, okay. Uh, speaking of tech stuff and, and everything, you mentioned that you have a really interesting tech stack. That's something that you like looking at and optimizing. What are the main uh, apps that you feel like you're using that you think other Shopify stores should definitely be using? Or what are the ones that they should not be using? Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I'll tell you what the stuff we're switching to. Like, So we're switching back to Klaviyo. Okay. Um, From where? We tried Sendlane. And uh -huh. you know, ultimately, like, I, I think there's a lot of reasons why somebody could excel on Sendlane. But Klaviyo is where we have the most history. And we just want to go back to where all of our data is. And like, there's a reason why mm, Klaviyo is the biggest sure. brand in the space. I think that, um, you know, we're going to probably see uh, a great added efficiency to just being back to the, 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 you know, the platform that we started on and that like, mm -hmm. we know the best. So it was a, it was a nice experiment. And like, again, like no disrespect to send lane, but uh, we are just to be honest, like we, we tried it and it didn't work for us. We're switching back to Clavio. So I'm excited for that. Working with a new email team. Um, and then also we are using one text for a tech stack. So that's new. Mm -hmm. So we're switching right now to one text. They have some exciting features, especially for subscription, because you can buy and renew in the text. You don't have to, um, you don't have to, you can leave it literally in the text. You just hit like confirm, send letter Y if you want to renew your subscription right now. Mm, so nice. cool. Yeah, that's great. Make it easier for people to be able to get what they want out of the text. Yeah. So um, otherwise, yeah, I mean, we are using Replo to build our website. So that's the thing. Like these days, drag and drop web building is really interesting. Like my, you know, our website, we've probably invested $100,000 into the Braxley website over the years. And the, the amount of improvements that we've made on it in the last three months that my brother has done for like the $100 a month Replo subscription, he's literally dragging and dropping shit. And it's, <laughs> he's made us sure. like the, the way way better performing website and it looks like cutting edge mm. whereas it felt like we were struggling to keep up even though we were spending top dollar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh that's interesting i i haven't seen a whole lot of people using replo at that level but i think that's uh, a good call out that not everything has to be on the most expensive uh custom version there's a lot that you can do with just straight up building yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I want to dig into a little bit of the backstory of you. Um, I always like to dig into who is Braxton Manley, who is the, the, the person we're talking to. Um, you mentioned that both of your parents were already uh, serial entrepreneurs. How did having serial entrepreneurs as a, as a, environment how did that make you into an entrepreneur like were there certain things that you guys did around the table where it's like hey let's talk about business ideas or like what is it about having entrepreneurs as parents <laughs> that you think made you an entrepreneur yeah i mean my dad would always have um is it cnbc on tv like the news like just like the business news i was just watching like you know what's what's the random daily thing even if it was like five minute glimpses where i didn't even know what was going on like that's sure. like the first thing that came to mind was just like thinking that business was interesting. Mm -hmm. And then like, I think that then led to like, yeah, really talking about business. Like I was really crafty. So like I would sell paintings actually. And like I would sell other random. Your like, own paintings? Yeah. Or like somebody I, else's? My own paintings. Yeah. That's cool. Like I, I, I like was an art student. So like I, I was actually like really artistic and would make some interesting stuff and still do. But so much of that energy now goes to actually using my art at the products and the brand art direction is usually all done by me. Um, cool. But yeah, I obviously then just like really liked the idea of, um, of having freedom. And like, I realized I wanted to be wealthy and like, I didn't, I didn't want, like, 
it kind of scared me to like, I was like, okay, I want to be in marketing. I think like, I want to do something around like creative brand design, marketing brand stuff, fashion maybe. But like, mm-hmm. I was like, I just really don't know how to, like, I don't want to work for anybody to do this. I ha- and then it, the more I kind of grew up and, and, and got educated in college and business school, I was like, oh, I get it. I have to like actually just come up with like a business plan and then figure out accounting. And sure enough, you know, you, you can just start a business. Sure. I, I like that. Um, speaking of challenging and pushing yourself, uh, one of the things you told me is that you have this odd quirk where you like to push yourself to stay up to like 3 a.m. or later once a week. Why? That sounds miserable. Yeah. So I am definitely a naturally more of like a, a night owl type so I know some people get this crazy burst of energy, like at like five in the morning, if they, if they wake up, like before the sun rises, like sure. that's when like the like riders will do their best riding. But there's also a half of the world of riders that find that extra burst of energy of like creative flow in the late mm-hmm. evening hours when everybody's asleep. It's like the idea is when the world feels like it's asleep, whether that's in the early hours or the late hours, there's... You, you can sense the quiet of the world. And then I feel like ideas flourish. So um, give yourself a weekly, either super early morning or super late night where you literally are, are doing it intentionally for ideas. I like that. Um, somebody fact checked me on this, but I believe... One of the reasons why that method works uh, is because it shuts off dopamine to the frontal cortex of your brain. Dopamine in the frontal cortex, from what I understand, causes you to be very task driven. This is what needs to get done. Stay on task. Stay focused. The same thing that coffee ends up doing when you're feeling a little bit tired or groggy. But staying up late uh, at that point in time, uh, it, dopamine has been shut off to the frontal cortex and you're allowed now to have your brain kind of go through a lot of other different types of thoughts and less about like what's more productive, which I think allows for a lot more creativity. Heck yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it has worked for me. You know, I think that I have gotten a lot of my most like abstract business ideas, whether that's even like coming up with the idea for mystic, like, and then furthermore, like the branding, like, all that came up like I was like two in the morning. I was listening to like the Rolling Stones and like I I just really liked the lip logo that they were using. And I realized like it all clicked in one one moment where we were, we were trying this like Pegasus branding for Mystic. We were, yeah. you know, we were trying to make it mystical, like almost Lord of the Rings style. And then I, I had this epiphany where it's like, that's not the direction to go with it. Like. Mystic gum is a beauty product. And then like, you know, so now our logo is, um, you know, is lips Mm. and it's, it's, but it's, it's lips done in a way that is a little bit evocative of the Rolling Stones. So it's not like full blown feminine lips. It kind of feels more like rock and roll lips. And it's, so it's, it's, I've, you know, thought all this through because it's so important to figure it out day one so that you know who you're Mm -hmm. trying to really speak to as a business. Yeah, uh, I I totally agree with being able to figure that out a lot more early on and speaking to the right person. Um, Branding and positioning are something that are highly undervalued um, in a lot of areas of D2C um, where it's just based on performance. And I think that we just we fail to see the qualitative impact that good branding, intentional branding can have. Yep. I understand that you once got to meet Mark Cuban and you got him to try on one of your Apple watch bands. Um, Getting to meet somebody, you know, of Mark Cuban status is cool, but actually getting him to try this on. How, how did this happen? And you're just like, Hey Mark, put this on. He's like, sure. Sounds good. Braxton. No problem. It was South by Southwest. And we were, it was our first year there. And I don't know, South by these days, isn't quite the same thing it used to be, but we, we're one year out of college and it was like, Hey, we are, we are at South by Southwest to like really make a name for ourselves. Like we heard it was like 
where to get discovered, like all these things. Like you could just like mm-hmm. throw this out by Southwest and something big could happen to you. And so I had a backpack full of watch bands and me and my buddy Grant, we went to uh, this Mark Cuban fireside chat he was doing with a VC lady. And there was probably 500 people in the audience watching. And I was like, okay, I, I remember telling my buddy, I was like, I'm going to get this watch band on Mark Cuban. And, you know, he's like, how, how the hell are you going to do that? And I like, more than even just listening to what he was saying during the chat, I was focused on like, how am I going to get this on his wrist? Yeah. And I realized that there was probably going to be a Q&A afterward. And if there's a Q&A, somebody's going to be passing around a microphone to the, somebody in the audience. And like, so I, I saw the stage hand from across the way. I was like, I'm going to go stand right next to the stage hand guy. And sure enough, goes into Q&A, stage hand guy is like, you know, ready to go. He's like, any, any questions? And I was like the first guy to raise my hand. I was right next to the stage hand guy. So I had the nice. first question to Mark Cuban. And I remember just asking him, I said, Mark, I see you have an Apple Watch on. I make the most comfortable Apple Watch fans in the world. Uh, I have one right here in Mavs colors for you. It was a blue band. Nice. And so yeah. he, I remember him saying, he goes, I'll try anything once. And then in front of the whole crowd, like tried it on. Everybody's going crazy. And then the Austin Business Journal like wrote an article about us that that's awesome. that whole thing. And it was a really fun like publicity thing that happened to us early on. I So I love so much about that that I want to call out because it wasn't just by accident, right? Like you went there intentionally with this in mind. Um you knew that there's going to be a question and answer afterwards. So you positioned yourself ready to be able to ask the question. You, you had the band ready to go and you knew enough about Mark Cuban to say like, and this is in Mavs colors, right? Like there was something that, like, there was so much behind this that it could seem like it was like a random luck of the draw shot, but you, you architected this to make it happen. And I think that's what I like most about this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that was probably five years ago now. Um, and, and we actually did give him a, a band a second time at South by Southwest another year. So we haven't heard from him, by the way, okay. but he at least has two watch bands now on two separate occasions. I think on the third one, he'll, he'll want to make us a deal. There you go. Um, so apparently he'll try anything more than once too, if it's, if it's <laughs> something he likes and it's in Mavs colors. Right. Um, there was a quote that you mentioned to me the other day when we were chatting that I really liked, uh, that you live by. Um, Leonardo da Vinci said, to develop a complete mind, study the science of art, study the art of science, learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. This is a great quote. Why is this a quote that you feel is like one of the ones that you like to live by? Yeah, I. When I first heard that quote, it really spoke to me because I, I felt like I understood what he meant by that on a deeper level. The learn how to see part to me doesn't necessarily obviously means learn how learn how to see it means like learn how to see things for what they are and learn how to see some vision in what you're doing and and like for instance like that, you know that that quote what that means to me is in the Mark Cuban example like learn how to see the way to get the band on Mark Cuban mm. mm-hmm. and so i love that quote from da vinci uh, i think that it speaks to me as an artist yeah, I think that's good. And I think to to your point then, you know, or to, to Leonardo's point, uh, art is science and science is art. And you have to see them both for what they are and how they are interchangeable in many facets and areas of life. And I think that's that's good. Yeah. And the, the everything is connected part is so key, too. And like I that one is very you could take that in a really deep way. But like there's like, you know, this saying like there's like a law of reciprocity to the world. Mm-hmm. It's called I think the the traditional word for it is I me. And so think about the law of reciprocity, meaning like whatever you give is what you will receive in equal value, no matter what, if it doesn't Mm -hmm. seem like it, it is. And so like for, you know, the whole saying like put good in, get good out. It's, it's kind of synonymous to karma, but think about that with your customer. Like if they feel like they got ripped off, they're never going to buy from you again. What you want them to feel is that you over delivered mm-hmm. and that that's challenging. Um, you know, for us, for instance, we sell a $39 Apple watch band made out of the best materials in the world. 
Um, it's really a great band, totally originally designed by me. We put a lot of love into it. But it's a $39 band, and we're now competing with knockoffs on Timu and Amazon mm -hmm. for a dollar. Sure. And so, you know, think about how great of a challenge it is to feel like a customer is getting over delivered to when the, when you're facing competition like that. And that's the new that's the new era of the American DTC brand owner that they're we're dealing totally. with. Totally. And I think a lot of what we're looking at then is the quality of the ingredients that go into it, you know, the the product, et cetera. I, I think I've even seen a lot of things that are on team who have uh, high amounts of certain chemicals that are, you know, known carcinogens. And, you know, we at least trying to do better by that. We're trying to make sure that the way that they were produced are produced by people who, you know, aren't, um, you know, factory slaves. And I mean, there's all these different things that you can do that I think, like you said, like over deliver in every area now. So over deliver to the customer, but over deliver to the person who's producing the band over deliver to the materials that are going into the band. And, and I think all of those things have a, have a place. Yeah. Um, I got one more that I really liked because there's a, there's a good moral to the story on this one. Uh, I understand that you sang brown eyed girl in high school and you forgot the lyrics. Yep. Um, what, what happened here? Tell me the story. Yeah, this is a, this is a, a great one for, for people in e-commerce and live business. <laughs> yep. If you don't prepare for your presentation it's not going to go well like the people that are actually the most prepared are the ones that make it look the most effortless like when people say oh they made that look easy that person for sure practiced it for 10,000 hours yeah and so yeah i basically you know had that lesson learned where i went on stage uh at the high school talent show Thinking I was, I, I was so smart at the time. I was going to be able to do Brown Eyed Girl. I planned on it the night before. <laughs> and I realized yeah. right before I was about to go on stage, I'm like, I don't know the second verse. <laughs> and sure no. enough, I manifested that reality. I go out on stage. I start singing the first verse, knowing at some point it's about to get bad. And then all of a sudden, like the words in my head, they slowly stop. <laughs> and then I'm like, all right, we're going back to the chorus again. And then I'm going to walk off stage. And I'm going to be like really embarrassed, you know? Yeah. And so like the, the lesson there is like in, in business, for instance, like if you say have a product launch and you launch and then all of a sudden you realize like the description isn't done properly or like mm -hmm. you're not like ready for it, like product launches are such a big deal. And we've also seen that before where we weren't ready for a product launch, but we were like, we're going to launch Friday, you know? And it's like, it's Monday. And we're like, we have plenty of time. We have four days. And all of a sudden it's the day before you're like, Whoa, we have a lot to do still. But email team said Friday, like they already have it queued up, ready to go. Like, I guess we're launching Friday. Yeah. And like, in reality, that probably would have gone so much better for the company if they launched Monday and spent the weekend with a few extra days. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I guess the other lesson there is like probably don't give yourself hard launch dates. Like we've we've always been pushing back and being flexible with timeline, knowing that unforeseen delays always happen and you got to just stay flexible with not just everything, everything in business. Yeah. Flexible with how what your expenses are, flexible with um what your timelines look like. Like we we're working a little slower now than we used to because we have three businesses, but it's it's still working. Like it's better. Like I know there's some stuff where I'm like, I'm not going to be able to get to that this week. And I just have to accept that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm balancing everything the best that I can. Mm -hmm. um, and that thing can wait till next week. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Um, I think the idea of preparation, you know, you, you flip that and obviously you have learned from that and that shows in that Mark Cuban situation where it's like, there was preparation there. You had the bands with you. You knew about, his team, you, you prepared there, There's so much more about that, that I think it's, it's good to have to go through some of those easy failures. Alex Ramosi talks about this. And I really appreciate the idea of you want your kids to be strong, but you don't want them to go through things that make them strong. You want them to be patient, but you don't want them to go through the things that'll make them patient. It's like, you want them to be prepared. 
but you don't want them to have to get up in front of the stage and sing Brown Eyed Girl and realize they don't know the second verse. You're going to make them want to be prepared, right? It's like you, they have to go through those things in order for that to become a core thing in your, in your mind. Yep, that's it. Um, so you're a singer. Uh, are you going to serenade us? You're my brown eyed girl. <laughs> I don't know any of Nice. No, 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 that's good. I, I, I didn't expect you to actually sing and the spin. I love it. <laughs> we really, we really lucked out today, folks. Um, Braxton, it's been absolutely amazing talking to you today. If you uh, had people that wanted to work with you or if they want to follow you, what's the best way for them to connect with you, stay in touch with you? Um, Twitter is some, or X is a platform I'm definitely trying to like do my most of my networking on. Um, so check me out, Braxton Manley on X. Um, I'm Braxton Manley on any of the Instagrams. Great too. Just, yeah, feel free to ask me a question and, um, I'll get back to you. And, um, I hope this was valuable to anybody listening. Yeah, I love it. And I do follow you on X, um, and we interact there and you do share out some good stuff. So definitely worth a follow there. If you guys are on X. Um, otherwise I appreciate you jumping on, sharing your knowledge, your time with us today. Let's go. Thanks for having me on. William. Yeah. Thank you everybody else for tuning in. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks for listening to the up arrow podcast with William Harris. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.